Welcome to Fox TV News, where everything is true. An RSC calls for stricter measures for failure to pay traffic tickets. A call is being made for stricter punishment for people not paying for traffic tickets or appearing in court. This call has come from the Vice Chairman of the National Road Safety Council, Dr. Lucien W. Jones. Dr. Jones says that while police are doing their job by issuing tickets to offenders, more needs to be done regarding those who are not complying. He says the system needs a complete overhaul. Dr. Jones says that with continued improvement of the electronic ticketing system and stricter enforcement, significant change can occur. Dr. Jones is also suggesting that when drivers who have an excess number of tickets are brought before the court for one of those offenses, there should be a system in place to have their driver privilege suspended. We say under the current structure, too many repeat offenders are able to slip through the cracks. PNP to help persons evicted from Bernard Lodge to take legal action against the government. The opposition People's National Party PNP says it will be helping persons affected by Thursday's demolition exercise on the outskirts of Clifton in Bernard Lodge, St. Catherine, to take legal action against the government. Opposition leader Mark Golden said a team led by PNP Vice President Norman Scott visited residents on Sunday afternoon. In a video posted to his Twitter account on Sunday evening, Golding said his party intend to take action against the government's religious practice of evicting people and destroying their homes without due process and without providing suitable alternative accommodation and compensation for their lost investment. Golding said PNP councillors will be providing funds to help residents with legal fees and the chairman of the party's Human Rights Commission, Issa Buchanan, will provide legal representation. He said the PNP Women's Movement will source counseling services for the residents. Golding said the PNP would also be taking other action against the government but did not provide details. On Saturday, McCann called for anti honest led administration to make restitution to persons affected by Thursday's demolition exercise. He said the actions of the government represented a blatant disregard for the tenets of the United Nations Convention on Human Rights and Supporting International Conventions to which Jamaica is a party. Surges begin on the Code Care Project. The first three beneficiaries of the Ministries of Health in U.S. Project Code Care underwent clinical procedures last week. Code Care aims to further improve wait time for a wide range of elective surgeries, including those for cataracts as well as oral and sinus cancers. In his sectoral presentation in Parliament in May, Health and Wellness Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton revealed that since March 2020, many hospitals have been had to suspend the normal processing of elective surgeries. This has resulted in the extension of the length of time that people wait for, for these operations, sometimes up to two years. The minister is promising that the introduction of code care will ease the stress with a plan for an additional 1,000 surgeries over the next 10 months to clear up most, if not all, the backlog. Dr. Tufton says the project got off in a practical way last week in St. James. He also revealed that he will shortlistly announce details concerning the arrival of an overseas medical team later this month to support local surgeons to clear up the backlog. The Nurses Association of Jamaica had expressed some concern with the Code Care project. NAJ President Patsy Edwards said her organization, like some medical doctors, feel it didn't appear practical to go that road. However, Dr. Tufton insists the move is a win-win for the health sector. Lower energy costs predicted following ban on incandescent light bulbs. In 2018, CARICOM decided to start banding incandescent lighting. This move was made in an effort to promote efficiency and energy conservation, as well as protect consumers from having underperforming light bill while providing tangible energy saving. On September 19 this year, Cabinet approved a ban on the import, export, manufacture, distribution, and sale or purchase of incandescent light bulbs. The ban will take effect on April 1, 2022. Studies were done by the Jamaica Public Service JPS, the Ministry of Science, Education and Technology in 2019 and 2020 respectively. The studies show that switching from 60 watt incandescent bulbs to 90 watt LED bulbs in the home could reduce energy consumption by 85%. The Ministry recommends that the use of LED bulbs as they are energy saving and have greater longevity. LED lighting produced typically lasts 3 to 5 times more than contracted fluorescent bulb or 30 times longer than an incandescent bulb. Furthermore, it is estimated that replacing such bulbs 
with higher efficiency lighting like LEDs could save Jamaica 1.3 billion per annum. In the coming months, the MSET will embark on a more comprehensive public education campaign to inform citizens of the benefits of replacing incandescent light bulb with energy efficient lighting technologies. However, in recognizing that other sectors in the market will need more time to adjust, for example, special permitting consideration will be given to small chicken farmers, the MSET said. Following this decision, Responsible Minister Darrell Falls highlighted that this span is another step in the government's quest for the nation to become more energy efficient and reduce its carbon footprint. While the ban on incandescent light bulbs, we as citizens should experience a better lighting performance from energy saving bulbs and also realize saving on our energy bills. We will also see a reduction in our overall CO2 emission collectively. Our goal should see us saving as a nation, Paul stated. Murder Maniac The fatal shooting of Oshin Matumba Earl by the police in Pepper St. Elizabeth last Wednesday put an end to what sources say was a trail of blood left by the medical killer who was at the top of the St. James Police Most Wanted list. Hours after Motumba's death, Senior Superintendent of Police in charge of operations in St. James, Aaron Samuels, told reporters that residents of Barnet Town and Springmount were signed with relief as he had terrorized both communities. Since then, sources have pointed to at least seven murders, a number of robberies and shootings, which were linked to Motumba over the past three years. According to the sources, Motumbo first hit the police radar when he allegedly committed a murder on November 4, 2019. In that incident, a man known only as Ali, a laborer of Corner Road, Dumsfry, St. James, was sitting at his mother's shop with his family members when he was sponsored on by a gunman, later identified as Motumbo, who shot him all over his body. Wanted for questioning in connection with that murder, Motumbo went under the radar and did not resurface until March 2021 when the police linked him to a second murder. That time, Brian Coote was fatally shot in the Spring Garden era of St. James. The sources say this was possibly a case of jungle justice, as Coote was a drug addict who would go about the community stealing agricultural produce. Coote was also believed to be associated with members of the Crocs gang, which operates in the Spring Garden community, and which was being targeted by Motumba and the Churchman gang, with which he was linked. With his reputation now being in the St. James criminal underworld, Matumbo attracted the attention of the police again in October 2021 when Shaw Clark was murdered as he left a bar in St. James. It is believed that Clark was marked for death because he had shared a relationship with Matumbo's ex-girlfriend. The sources say Matumbo's attack on the Crocs gang continued in February this year when he and another man attacked and shot three people, including a 19-year-old who was believed to be a senior member of that gang. On May 5th, another alleged member of the Crocs gang, 24-year-old Dino Scott, otherwise called Brandit, was fatally shot in Spring Gardens. Investigators later linked Mutumba to that killing. The murder of the former Duane Russell in Adelphi Mountain Spring Gardens on May 18 and Kerry and Dixon hours later, allegedly by Mutumba, caused the police to intensify their search for the man who was known among the most wanted. The next day, Members of a police team were on foot patrol in Spring Gardens when Matumba was spotted. He was ordered to stop, but instead turned and fired at the police. The police shot back, but Matumba ran into a yard and escaped. Two days later, a man, whose name is being withheld, reported to the police that he was asleep inside his house when he was alerted by his sister that an intruder was inside the building. The man said he looked up and saw Matumba standing over him with a gun, pointing in his direction. According to the man, Matumba demanded that he hand over cash that was being kept inside the house. He escaped with just over $400,000. With the search for Matumba now on an earnest, on June 1, a police military team targeted a house in which he was reported to hide in. The sources say as the security officers approached the house, Matumba and another man ran from the building with guns, pointing in the direction of the security team. The police and soldiers fired in the direction of the fleeing men. A search was conducted of the era but neither of the men was found. Having escaped, Matumba was back in action days later when he held up a woman in Spring Garden. The woman reported to the police that a man wearing a mask and armed with a rifle attacked her inside her house. She said she pulled on the mask of her attacker, revealing his face and immediately recognizing him. According to the woman, Matumba then pointed the rifle towards her feet and fired one shot. He then began to search the house 
and was joined by another man armed with a handgun. They left it approximately $150,000, which the woman had in the house. With his reputation made as a gun for hire and a cold-blooded killer, Matumba next struck in German town St. James on September 4, where he was identified as the man who shot dead 26-year-old Gary Morgan and shot two other men who survived. Three days later, the fatal shooting of Chrysanthi Wilson and Shabar Goldson was also pinned to Matumbo. Police report that he had been visiting Wilson for some time as they shared an intimate relationship. Wilson had reportedly decided to end the relationship. Matumbo refused to accept that it was over and in a jealous rage, fatally shot the two. Police investigators also told reporters that while it has not yet been confirmed, Matumbo might have been involved in a triple murder in Bontehaw Trilwan in January. In that incident, Daniel Williams, Tasha Black, and Chinila Clark were fatally shot by four men armed with high powered weapons. According to investigators, spent casing phone at the scene were matched to the gun used by Motumbo in at least two other killings. Please remember to subscribe, like, share, and click the notification bell.